Hey everybody, it's Professor Parrish. I hope you guys have been having a great week three and we are gearing up to start week four. So exciting. <laughs> um, so before we get started, I just wanna do a few housekeeping things of what is due this coming week and what to expect for the week to come because we are quickly, uh, believe it or not, we have this week and next week to focus on fiction and then we will be wrapping fiction up. Now, that doesn't mean that we're getting rid of fiction. We will, when we get to our final paper in the class, you have the option to come back to this genre, but we are reaching the end of at least discussing the elements of fiction. So. Uh, let me get out of here. All right, and we are back. <laughs> I'm in my little box over here. <laughs> so for week three right now, um, I'm recording this Sunday night as we end week three. So your paper outline was due Sunday night as well as the discussion three forum responses. This coming week, week four, you will have your second reading response, reading response number two, as well as the week four discussion forum. So you are going to get a little extra time with this first paper. And um, the reason why I do that is it is our first paper, so I want everybody to get into the groove of writing, of scheduling their time for assignments, and to kind of get adjusted to everything in the class. So that's why we do get an extra week on paper one, even though from the sounds of your outlines, most of you have pretty much, you'll probably get paper one done perhaps before then, and that's awesome. So if that is the case, week five will go ahead and open up. Um, it will actually open up starting, um, oh, well, you've already been able, you can actually turn in paper one if you like. So that Dropbox is open. Um, the exam, as you can see here, is not open yet. I will be opening it at the end of week four. Um, I might open it up Friday of this coming week um, on February 1st, just to give you a head start if you want. And then the discussion forum obviously is already open too. So if you get paper one finished in week four, you can go ahead and turn it in. There is nothing wrong with that. Um, I actually, if you feel confident, I am always open to grade early, and that way you get um, some time to revise that paper if you want. And I'll talk more about revisions next week. As far as reading response two goes, if I click on that, um, there is actually a video that we're going to watch this week. It um, it stars Lindsay Ellis. She is probably one of my favorite internet video creators. She is a scholar in film studies and rhetoric and composition from NYU. And she used to do a series when I was in college called the Nostalgia, Tri Nostalgia Chick. And it was kind of cheesy and, and the humor was a little off in places. But as she's gotten older, um, she started to do more scholarly videos. And I really like her scholarly things that she does. So this video is all about Stranger Things and the movie It, the revival of It, and kind of nostalgia in general. And it's really interesting. I think it plays definitely to genres of literature that we're talking about this unit. And so that's what we're going to watch this week. And then your reading response is going to be to answer these three questions and to explain your answers, make sure you're using proper grammar, proofread your answers, and make sure you're using complete sentences. Um, and they're due by February 3rd. So I'm really excited to see what you think of the video. I really enjoy it. So I'm curious to see. Um, she does talk fast. That is the one thing about her videos is that she does talk fast. Now, granted, these are on YouTube, so you can go back and rewatch whatever you need to. I would watch with the closed captioning. There's, um, I'll show you. If you click on the link, I'm going to pause it so we don't spoil anything. Okay, so it's on ad. You'll see this little CC button in the corner um, for closed captions. If you click on it, it will automatically do English. If I click again, it's off. If I click, it's on. So, and then if you do settings, um, you can do English or auto translate. I would just do the English ones because they're the auto translate is kind of like Microsoft Sam or Google trying to decipher what she's saying and it's off. So um, just click the CCs, watch the video, and hopefully you all enjoy it. But yeah, and then when you're done, you can upload the file for that. Hopefully you all enjoy that assignment. But uh, as far as what we are doing this week, we are finishing up our discussion of the elements of fiction, which is pretty exciting. So uh, have down here work on your paper drafts, your discussion forum, and then um, the reading response number two and then to watch the video, which we are going over right now. Um, the Sen Gage Handbook, we are still going over and reviewing drafting and revising this week. 
Um, again, if you had the Cengage Handbook for English 121, this will still be review. I would definitely skim through drafting or revising and just make a mental note of it, or at least put those pages away, because next week in week five, we're going to talk a little bit about the whole revising of our papers in this class, and I'm going to come back to that. So just make a little mental note. This part of the Cengage Handbook, you can skim over it, read it this week, and if you're like, I don't really know how this is going to tie in, make a mental note, and we will review back over it next week for sure. But we are going to finish up talking about Chapter 7 theme, which is pages 261 to 263, and Chapter 7 style, Chapter 8 style, which is page 309 to 320. So if I go down to our resources, go down here to week 4, and we have our wonderful fiction presentation. Now I have a new computer, as I stated last week, and I don't quite have everything set up. <laughs> I'm working on it. I've been doing a lot through Google Docs, so I don't actually use Microsoft Word um, on this computer as much. I usually will go through Google Docs and do the download as option so that it will download as a Microsoft document on my computer, but I don't have to have the program yet. Um, so it's opening it up right now. But in your textbook, the Chapter 7, chapter on theme, starts on page 260 and 261. And we have our lovely footprints in the sand as our metaphor for this chapter and kind of the meaning and purpose behind it, which I really like that that's the, the chapter picture. You'll notice that the chapter pictures in this book are, they're not on the nose, but they do correlate with what the chapter is about. So with this chapter being about theme, you can look at the footprints in the sand. What does that mean? It takes on various interpretations depending on like your religious beliefs or just you personally. So there's a, a lot to go over here. So I'm going to click out of that. All right. So our chapter is on theme and style. And as you have probably noticed, much of these chapters are just example stories and these chapters are no exception. But on page 262, we start to, um, 261 to 262, get into the meat of this chapter. The idea that I like behind fiction and prose especially is that a lot of times, even though the author garners a specific meaning to the chapters or to the stories themselves, a lot of it is that we, the audience, do kind of formulate our own opinions after we read. If you are familiar at all with any type of literary theory, there is this famous theory by Roland Barth that talks about the death of the author. And one of the videos we'll watch with Lindsay for our discussion forums and reading responses actually talks about this. And it's all about death of the author. And what death of the author means is it's a literary concept that once you write something, it is no longer yours. You as the author no longer exist. Everything is put into what the reader interprets and what the reader gets out of it. So I could write a story and intend it to mean something, and I can make it as black and white as possible. But you, the reader, you may find a different interpretation based on that book. And you might not be wrong. It's just totally what you are getting out of it. And that's kind of the point of Death of the Author. We, the authors, have no control over how you interpret our work. And that's scary. <laughs> and it's exciting and fun and dangerous all at the same time because we as readers come into a text all from different backgrounds, from different ethnicities, from different religions, from different social constructs and beliefs, from different family structures. We come into a story with our own environment behind us, and that helps to tailor how we interpret things. So that picture of the footprints in the sand on the theme title page, to me, I can inter infer a meaning behind of it from a religious standpoint. But someone who is maybe not viewing it from that direction can get a whole different meaning out of it. And neither of us are wrong. We're just coming at that image from our own interpretations. And that's really what's nice about fiction and literature is that you can do that. So that's kind of what the whole point of this chapter is, is talking about theme and how our writers give text interpretations, purposes, and meaning. So the big questions that we should ask ourselves when we're thinking about theme are one, what do we want readers to take with them when they're done reading? So if I'm the writer and you all are writing paper one, the first question with theme you should be asking is, what do I want readers to get out of this story? By the end of it, how, what should they take with them? Should it be, you know, 
a lesson about humility? Should it be a message about trauma and perseverance? I mean, what do you want them to get out of the story that you're telling? Um, what do you want them to learn? If anything, do they need to learn a lesson? Is this story just for their enjoyment and there's not really anything they should learn from it? I mean, what do you want them to get out of the meaning or purpose? What is the point of the story? And if you can't find the point of a story, then you need to think about it. Because if your writing doesn't have meaning, you're not going to be engaged with it. You're not going to want to do it. And your readers are going to be able to tell. So that's why even though all of our papers in this class have a general theme, I want you to pick the topic because I want you to determine what the importance and purpose of that story is. Because that's going to drive you as a writer and it's going to make your audience more engaged because they're going to see that when they read your story. They're going to see your passion on the page. That's kind of the point of that. Um, and then finally, what is the overall impression you want them to have after reading? How do you want them to walk away from the story? Is it a sad story? Do you want them to feel melancholy, saddened? Do you want them to feel hopeful by the end of it? Do you want them to feel like they need to go out and do something and feel empowered or impassionate? I mean, what do you want them to feel, learn, and take away from your story? Those are probably the three most important things to ask when you're determining theme. And some writers just write a story for the fun of it. They just want to write a story. Um, Alice in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll. He was just writing a story for his friend's children. There really wasn't a big meaning behind it. He just wanted to write a fun, quirky kid story. And again, we go back to this thing right here. People have broke down and dismantled Lewis Carroll's um, Alice in Wonderland for years. And, and I have too, because I really like Alice in Wonderland, but people have like deconstructed it and said like, here's these like psychedelic meanings behind things. And here's the historical context. And here's what this symbolizes in this. And then some people are saying, no, it's just a kid story. And he was just making stuff up as he went along because he was trying to entertain this kid. Who knows what the real meaning is? Um, unless the author just straight up comes out and says it. And I don't foresee Lewis Carroll ever predicting that people will be talking about Alice in Wonderland hundreds of years after he's wrote it. But here we are. <laughs> but the point is, is that, you know, his whole reasoning was that he just wanted to make something entertaining that a child could read and enjoy and have their imagination sparked. Whereas other writers may have totally different reasons for creating the text that they do. So those things are always just something to consider when you're writing and reading a text. Like what, what is the purpose of this story? I'm going to move my little window here. So as you're writing and as you're thinking about themes, our book talks about three things on page 262 that we should quote unquote beware when we're writing a theme. Uh, the first are large abstractions and they are generally misleading or extremely vague generalizations that make your reader ask, well, what was the point of that? Um, it may be a sign that you're too vague with your theme. If you're trying to, um, some writers want to try to leave things so open to interpretation that their reader really doesn't get the point of it. Um, I will say an example. There was a movie that I watched a few years ago. It had Robert Pattinson in it. And it was a really weird movie, and I'm trying to think of the name of it, and it slipped my mind. But it's really, like, stylistic and um, edgy and weird, and it was good up until the very end. And at the very end, I didn't mind the ending. I thought it was okay. It was kind of out of left field and weird. But at the end, I asked myself, what was the point? And that really took me out of the movie because at the end of it, I kept seeing all this like strange artistic choices. And I'm like, well, there has to be some kind of meaning behind it. Maybe he's trying to make a point and we never got there watching the movie. And that's the one thing I was like, I don't know. And it really kind of prevented, prevented that film from becoming really great to me from being just a, oh, that was a good movie to a, that was an awesome movie. All because the theme just didn't really add up or make sense. So you've got to be careful not to be too vague there needs to be some intention behind it. Your readers may gather a different intention, but you at least need to have some kind of vision in mind as you write. Uh, 
in opposite of that, oversimplification is something you don't want to do as well. I mean, you don't want to quote unquote dumb down your story to where your readers feel like they're, you know, grade school kids, unless that's your intention. If you're writing for grade school kids, then yes, please make it simple. <laughs> but if you're writing a story for an adult audience, then you need to make sure that your story is not too simple and it's not too like minimal. You want to have some depth there so that your readers have a, a reason to keep reading or read it again, right? If a story is too simple, then they'll read it once and be like, okay, that was it. And there won't be anything for them to go back to or to reread or latch onto. And then finally, avoid cliches. And I feel like cliche is, is kind of a cliche word itself ironically it's it's kind of become its own cliche but the idea is that tropes are stereotypes that are very 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 common um we see some themes used over and over again to the point where they become boring and that's kind of when they become cliche or they're expected the audience can see it coming and so you want to try to avoid that engage your audience without playing up to their expectations although that can backfire Sometimes people go a totally opposite way without justification, and then that leads to it being just a very unsatisfying, weird ending if there's no lead up to it. So, I don't know. I heard that the movie Glass has one of those endings where you're like, wait, what was the point? Or what? <laughs> I've just heard that. I was excited to see Glass, and then I saw all these bad reviews and was like, mm, I don't know. Maybe I'll wait till it comes out um, on streaming. That is my dog, Huckleberry, who is upset that I'm not throwing a ball right now. I'm talking to you all instead. All right. Uh, long story short, with theme, it's about a delicate balance. It's about knowing your audience. If you're writing to adults, treat them like adults. Um, a lot of times students will, I will ask a student, who is your audience? And their answer will be anybody, anyone in general. And I'm like, really <laughs> anyone so you're writing for kindergartners you're writing for 80 year old uh men you're writing for red hat society you're writing for ffa members you're writing for high school juniors you're writing for aarp members you're writing for baseball players in puerto rico you're right what is your point who is your audience and you can't just say anybody because that is too general <laughs> you have to at least have some kind of audience in mind. Now, it doesn't have to be specific as some of those examples I just said. You can say, I'm writing to adults. Okay, that is at least specific enough. Or you can say, I'm writing to children. That is specific enough. But you just can't say you're writing to anyone because that's not specific enough. And you want your genre, your theme to challenge your audience, but you don't want to like you don't want your theme to be too complicated to where your reader loses interest or they're like, oh, I just don't get it. And they give up, you know, you want to inspire your readers and challenge them, but not make it to where it's over their heads. Um, delicate balance. Like I said, Th that's pretty much theme. Theme is hard to explain because there's so many different types of themes. And I'm sure if I gave you a story right now that you had read and asked you to pick out the theme, you probably could. It probably wouldn't be hard for you to pick out the theme. Um, because typically a story that's been published, even if it may have a bad theme or one that's not fully constructed, it'll have one. Otherwise, the editors would be like, no, we can't publish this yet. There's no theme. There's no point. So typically, I would assume that if you've read a story that has been published, it's got a theme. And you can probably list that theme. But um, it's kind of hard to define until you actually get down and start writing it. So that's chapter seven in a nutshell. I know, bud. There it is. All right, chapter eight is all about style. I would say style is probably my second favorite element of fiction other than um, symbolism. It's probably my second favorite. And it is, our book defines on page 309, style is the way a writer uses language to create his or her reality in a story. And we just finished Tweak and Beautiful Boy. And we can talk about style. <laughs> um, you will probably have noticed that Tweak and Beautiful Boy are extremely different in terms of style. Um, Nick Chef, who writes Tweak, uses a very raw, organic, almost like stream of consciousness memoir style of writing, which makes sense because Nick is not a professional writer. He, when he wrote Tweak, he very much was just a kid who had been addicted to drugs who was just writing his experiences down. So there are grammar errors. There are parts that kind of 
teeter off and don't really lead anywhere. And usually when a story is published, it has a team of editors surrounding it. And those editors will, will tweak the work, so to speak, <laughs> will tweak the work and change it and make edits to where it's at this nice, grammatically correct formatting to be published. But I believe that when Nick had this book published, he told them, I don't want it edited. I just want it to look like I originally wrote it. And that's pretty much what they did. And I think it turned out well because of it. Now, David Sheff, the father who writes Beautiful Boy, if you noticed in that story compared to Nick's, totally different style. He was It was clean. It was crisp writing, articulate, great grammar and spelling. Everything was formatted perfectly. And the reason, I don't know if any of you actually read up on David Sheff as you're reading these stories. The reason is, is that David Sheff is a renowned journalist and public writer. <laughs> um, I didn't know either until I read the book, but Nick Sheff is a legit professional writer and he has been published. He's been a like a journalist for years and it shows his writing is, extre is extremely professional. And I think in some ways it makes me like Nick's version a little more because I know how much David has worked to polish his version and make it look just right, whereas Nick's is very raw and organic. But on the same end, David's story is really enjoyable because he's a professional writer and he knows how to use the elements of fiction. Even though he's writing nonfiction, he knows how to use those elements of prose to make a good story. So I really appreciated that everybody in the discussion forum had a different answer. Like, not everybody was for Nick, not everybody was for David. You all had your own reasons for liking whichever version you did more. And I think everybody was justified in, in their choices. And that's all because style is about making a statement. It helps set the mood of the story. It can be traditional, like David Chef is a very traditional nonfiction read. Nick Chef is very experimental. It, it kind of breaks convention in a lot of ways from what you normally see in a book. And both are good. They're just good in their own respects. And I like that. I like how subjective style is. Everybody can tell a story from a different perspective and a different way. And that's what makes literature fun because we all have different tastes and different likes. And style sort of reflects that in the final version. Yeah, bring me your ball. Yeah, bring me. Okay. Um, types of style are listed on page 310. We're going to get away from that creepy clown face that's on page 308. I don't like clowns. <laughs> um, one type of style... These three types of style are just three specific ones, but again, there are many, many types of ways to write stories, but these are three that the book focuses on. The first is called understatement, in which the author uses minimal or simplistic language to let the reader kind of fill in the blanks. So it's, it's not minimalism, because minimal, min, minimalism is an author intentionally leaving things out just to be basic. Bring it here. Um, but understatement is almost like the author is very aware of what they are doing to, to kind of create a dramatic effect. So, for example, in Kurt um, Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse-Five, which is one of my favorite books, um, he often uses the phrase, so it goes, to exemplify something horrific that has happened. So, the start of the book starts around World War II, and he talks a lot about the death and destruction during that time. And one of the things that he says is, you know, he'll he'll go on like paragraph after paragraph about this like carnage that's happening on the European coast. And then, you know, he's like, well, there were like thousands of bodies on the ground. So it goes. And just that line, so it goes, has so much weight and bearing to it that the minute you read it as a reader, it's as if all of those deaths in that one scene just sink into your system and your stomach just drops out. And there are parts of that book where he will describe something horrifying and then just say, so it goes. Like it's normal. And that normalization in the book is really unsettling to you as a reader. And it's definitely this perfect use of understatement where he can just say those three words and we get the context as the reader of everything happening. And it's horrifying and it makes you like stop and think about it. And it, it does exactly what Vonnegut wants it to do. I mean, he could go on and preach about these horrible things and like the detriment to society and blah, blah, blah. But he says three words and that gets us as the reader to basically know everything he could have said in like a three page long rant. And it's beautiful. 
Beautiful use of language. Beautiful use of style. Um, formal is the opposite of understatement. It is when they use lavish and rich terminology and vocabulary to describe the story in detail. I would say that Charles Dickens is an expert at using formal style. And if you didn't know this about Charles Dickens, he was actually paid by the word to write in a lot of his texts. So, uh, A Christmas Carol, I have slogged through that. <laughs> I'm not a big Dickens fan because I, I need to get to the bottom of the story. And Dickens is so descriptive. He could take three paragraphs to describe the floor of a house. <laughs> and some people love that. Some people are like, no, it's so awesome. The formal and detail and formality and blah, blah. It's not my cup of tea. Dickens is not my style, but I get why he did that because a lot of his texts, he's like, if I'm getting paid by the word, I'm going to use a lot of words. And, um, you can tell, I mean, it worked for him. So, um, he's definitely an example of formal. So if you look up anything by Charles Dickens, um, that is a type of formal style where he is using lots of detail, expansive vocabulary, lavish and rich terminology and synonyms, and antonyms, just to get as much description as possible. That's formal. Um, and then finally, there is hyperbole, which is an exaggeration of language to pull in an audience or grab their attention, often used in dramatic, suspenseful text. And this one's kind of hard to find a good example for because it's really just, it depends on the author. Something that I noticed J.K. Rowling does in Harry Potter, which until I noticed it, I was actually, I was like, oh, I would never do that in my stories. And then I noticed she does it and I'm like, oh, okay. Um, she oftentimes when characters are yelling will have their text in all caps. I'm normally like, why would you put it in all caps? That looks awful. Don't do that. And then I see her do it in her work and I'm like, oh, okay. And I realized why it gets a pass from her um, because she uses it very sparingly. It's only in extremely dramatic, suspenseful moments that she uses this loud, all caps text. And because it's not used all the time, it, it's a good example of hyperbole and it works for what she's trying to do. So you could probably look up hyperbole examples in literature and you, you'll get some good, you'll get some good examples listed. But, um, if you <laughs> go find a chapter of Harry Potter where Harry is talking to the Dursleys and there will be some hyperbole used. <laughs> lots of all cap sentences, especially by Uncle Vernon. Oh, lots of that going on. All right. Um, we talked a little bit about abstract versus concrete in um, our preview chapter, number one, but we bring it back up here with style. Concrete, again, are tangible items that are found in reality, such as chairs or hair, or earth or lava, anything that you can touch that is tangible is concrete. Abstract are emotions, thoughts, ideas, feelings, things that you can't reach out and grab or things that cannot be accessed by the senses. You can't smell freedom. You can't taste exhilaration, despite what any commercial will say. You can't um, hear freedom or hear happiness. They are all inside inner concepts and they're different for everyone. My phone, in the English language, this is a phone. No one can question that. In the English language, this is a mug or a coffee cup, or it's a cup, mug, whatever. It's a form. It's, it's the same item. We will call it the same thing in the English language, no matter what. My idea of happiness is different than your idea of happiness. Some people are happy hunting. Some people are happy drawing. Some people are happy reading. Some people are happy playing video games. Some people are happy volunteering. Some people are happy going on trips or, or hiking or mountain biking. You know, everybody has their own definition of what feels like exhilaration, what feels like happiness, what is sadness, what is humor. Those ideas and emotions and concepts are different for all of us. And so they are abstract. They are not set in stone. If you think of concrete, you're like, it's set in stone. It is definitely lava. <laughs> Can't call it butterflies. It's for sure lava. Um, but an abstract thought or idea or emotion, it can vary from person to person. So it's a little harder to define. So that's, that's how to keep those two separated and check. And I think when we had our um, discussion forum or, or preview assignment, you all did a good job with those. Uh, denotation versus connotation. Denotation, I always remember as denotation, dictionary. 
the denotation is the dictionary definition, the matter of fact meaning to a word. So if you asked me what a flag is, I'd say, well, it's a piece of fabric of various colors. It's attached to a wooden pole or wooden or metal pole, and it represents a country club organization, whatever. Connotation is the emotional or symbolic meaning behind the word. So a flag may be a literal piece of fabric attached to a rod, but connotatively, a flag can represent a country, it can represent culture, pride, a lawful state, etc. It can represent a lot of different things emotionally, and that is connotation, the emotional meaning, whereas denotation is the dictionary meaning. And then we have a uh, literal versus figurative over here in small text. When someone says, I was literally there, that means you were. <laughs> literal is grounded in reality. When someone says that they are figuratively speaking, it means they're not being real. They're not serious. If I said, oh man, it's raining cats and dogs outside. I mean, figuratively speaking. I'm joking. I'm not being serious. But if I said it's literally raining cats and dogs, then it's the apocalypse and we should all worry. But, <laughs> um, but those are the two different meanings. So on your test for pros, I will, these two terms, literal and figurative will be on there along with metaphors and similes. Metaphors and similes, we often use stylistically to describe things. I think as a culture, Similes, the comparison of two or more things using like or as, are very common and easy to come up with because somehow between the movie Clueless and now, we use like a lot in our language. I think it's starting to come down a little bit, but a few years ago, I had people talk to me and they couldn't say a sentence without saying the word like in it. And I just sat there with my hands like this slowly fading off. But, um, and I catch myself doing it a lot. And I think because like is such an easy word to throw in a sentence. It's just easy. Just pop it in there. And for whatever reason, we all just accept it and go, okay, cool. But like is a simile. So if I say she's like the wind, I'm getting a little Patrick Swayze in there, uh, from Dirty Dancing. If I say she's like the wind, um, Obviously, she is not really the wind, but she may be like flighty or maybe flaky or maybe like, a, like if I say she's like a tornado, um, then, you know, a mess. Whereas a metaphor is doing the same thing. You're still comparing two or more things, but you're not using the word like or as. And I think those are harder to come up with in our society because we want to use like. So when we aren't able to, it makes it a little more complicated. But, um, Professor Kimball that teaches theater out here at SIC, he always would say, all the world's a stage, quote Shakespeare. And then we're all just actors. And you could say that, that'd be a metaphor. We're all just actors. Are we really actors? No. But is the point of that phrase to say that we're all putting on a front or pretending to be somebody we're not? That's what that phrase means. So all the world's a stage means that it's all just, it's all just a play. It's all just being put on for someone. Just depends on who that is. But um, in your exam, you will be asked to differentiate between metaphors and similes. So make sure that you know that metaphors do not use like or as. They just compare two or more things. Similes compare two or more things with like or as. Dialogue is often a stylistic choice. In your paper number one, you do not have to use dialogue if you don't want to. But you can. Um, however, when you use dialogue, you have to use proper punctuation. So, for example, when you do like, hello, she waved to him. Because I have this extra part here, if I just said hello, I would do quotation marks, hello, period, quotation marks. And that'd be it. But since I add this extra information here, I will say quotation marks, hello, comma, quotation marks, she waved to him, period. Because I'm interrupting... I need to put that comma before the other quotation mark. So if I do O, oh, quotation marks, O, oh, comma, quotation marks, he stammered, nearly dropping his books, comma, hey. So notice where the punctuation is before the quotation marks. Notice that. Notice that the punctuation is before the quotation marks. So always remember your punctuation needs to go before the quotation marks, whether it's where it starts or where it ends. Just be aware of that because I will count off on it on your paper if you are using dialogue.
So just be aware. All right. On page 312, we have parallelism and sentimentality talked about. Um, sentimentality is deliberately making your audience feel sad or pity a character or movie. There have been some dog movies recently come out, and I won't go see them because I have dogs, and I know that they are trying to use sentimentality to make me feel emotions, and it's not going to work, movie. I'm not watching you. But a lot of authors will use sentimentality to try to tug at their readers' heartstrings and make them feel for the characters, and, and it can work and it cannot work. Uh, when it is effective, it's very powerful. So do you all remember Homeward Bound? Do you remember that movie? came out in the 90s. Yeah, there's a scene at the end where for no reason Shadow, the adorable golden retriever that we all love, falls into a like pit <laughs> and can't get out. Why did that happen? There was no reason. They were like right there at their house. They didn't need that scene. They did it for sentimentality. They wanted to get those watchers and those viewers to just feel so bad for Shadow and it worked. We all did, but it was a deliberate stylistic choice. Did it impact the plot? No, I don't think so. It was just there to get one last tug at those heartstrings. Um, parallelism is the repetition of grammatically similar elements, creating a rhythm or building emotion to hammer home a point leading to the climactic finale. finale. So, um, parallelism is just a stylistic choice. Sometimes when a story starts towards the end, have you ever seen those where you start a story and it's like the character's in a very dramatic situation and then the character goes, let me back up and tell you how I got to this point. And then you spend most of the story getting back up to where you started. That's kind of parallelism. Or when a story starts a certain way, it ends in the exact same way. So um, if a character starts the story by floating down a river, and they end the story with floating down the river. That's kind of a parallel moment between the two of them. Again, these are not necessary for a story. They are just stylistic options that you, the reader, and the writer have the choice to put into your tale. And again, here's our example. Um, yeah, John Wick, sentimentality. Well, Why did the dog have to be there? Why? <laughs> um, I love John Wick, but I was just like, well... You had to make it a dog. Couldn't have been a gecko or couldn't have been like a picture frame or something. No, it had to be a living, breathing dog. If you've not seen John Wick, um, there's definitely sentimentality right there. Um, this story, too, um, I'm a big World War II buff, and I like seeing stories from both sides of World War II. I think it's interesting. Um, my grandfather fought in the Navy, and he was stationed outside of Iwo Jima, so I'm, I'm kind of obsessed with Japanese culture during World War II and studying like the lead up to certain events. So this movie is Grave of the Fireflies and it follows these two kids in Japan during World War II and it kind of shows their position and their kids so they don't know what's going on during the war. They don't get it um, but it kind of shows like their struggle to survive. Spoilers at the very beginning of the film one of our main character dies. <laughs> it's horribly sad. It's also a kind of example of sentimentality too, but he dies and that's the ghost of him seeing his body. So it's kind of an out of body experience. And he sees his little sister. Um, and then at the very end of the story, there's the same shot. He, this, that's the moment we end on with him dying and he's reunited with his sister. So it's a really sad story, but it's good. Um, I would highly recommend it, but only if you are mentally prepared to have yourself feel really bad for an hour and a half. Um, same with John Wick. <laughs> it's fun, but man, those first 30 minutes are pretty rough. Um, but those, again, are examples of parallelism and sentimentality. Irony, uh, real brief. I know chapter eight isn't um, focused on irony, but again, our book has lots of different definitions for irony. And I'm not a fan of some of them. Some of the definitions of irony, I'm going to move myself over here, I think are a little um, not correct. But our textbook in chapter 8 defines irony as the sad and comic contrast between expectation and event, between ideal and reality. And this definition, I really like. 
I think that out of all the definitions of irony that we are given in this textbook, this one is probably my favorite. Because when I think of irony, I think of what we expect and what actually happens as being contrasted. And so if you've not seen 500 Days of Summer, it's a movie that came out years ago. Um, there is a scene in this film. Our main character that's played by Joseph Gordon-Levitt um, has been dating this girl, Summer, which is played by Zoe Deschanel. And he's been dating her. They've been kind of off and on. And at one point in the film, he is invited to her party and he expects in his mind that this party is going to be the chance for them to rekindle their romance and their relationship. And so the filmmaker, which I think is pretty brilliant, um, he starts the film and has on one side of the screen expectations of what Joseph Gordon-Levitt's character thinks is going to happen and then what really happens. And this scene comes out of nowhere in the film. It's powerful. It is near the climax of the film, so it like builds all this escalation. The sound is perfect. So I wanted to show you all this clip just to show you kind of the irony of this expectations versus reality and show you what that's like. And, oh no, I'm going to back out here for just a second and pull that clip up. All right. So hold on just a second. All right. So here we go. We're going to watch this clip now. So, Tom, what is it that you do? I, uh, I write greeting cards. Tom could be a really great architect if he wanted to be. That's unusual. I mean, what made you go from one to the other? I guess I just figured, why make something disposable, like a building, when you can make something that lasts forever, like a greeting card? So yeah, that is a wonderful example of reality versus um, expectations and how irony kind of shows the, the contrast of that. And I really, really, really like that example through the use of 500 Days of Summer, which is a good film if you've not seen it. All right. So postmodern style we talk about on page 315, and it's a style of writing that knows what it is. So... When we think about genres of literature, back when people were writing Victorian literature, they didn't call it Victorian literature. They just called it 
literature because it was just the writing of the time, right? Well, we live in such a saturated world of prose and literature that we need genres to differentiate between all the texts. Because if you just walked into Barnes and Noble and there were just books everywhere, where would you start, right? So around the 20th century, naming books based on genres became a thing and writers started to adapt their work knowing what genre they were going to tailor to. So the idea of postmodern is that writers already knew what type of story they were writing before they wrote it. So a lot of writers had the opportunity to be kind of detached, elusive, wry, snarky, um, cynical. They could be that in their writing because they knew that's what they were doing, right? So a dystopian story could be dystopian and the author knew it because that was the genre they were writing for. So we have these terms that kind of talk about <laughs> a little bit of stylistic choices that authors can make. And um, probably some of my favorite are the ideas of absurd versus surreal. Now, uh, absurd are when you have elements that actually exist in reality, but they're just sort of out of place. So are there starfish and sponges in the ocean? Yes. Are there clothes like overalls and trucker hats and belt buckles? Yes. Are they normally on fish? No. Are there normally sponges and starfish and hamburger ships? No. So they are real things, real elements like clothing and these creatures, but they're just out of place with one another. They're not in the right context. And that's what makes them seem absurd. That's why it's funny. That's why SpongeBob SquarePants is funny as a kid's show because you're like, he's a sponge wearing pants. That's so weird. You know, it's, it's very absurd. It's not the normal reality that we live in. And that's kind of the point. So that's absurd. Surreal is where you get into Alice in Wonderland, dreamlike hallucinogenic elements. So the example that always stuck out in my mind as a kid was either the, um, the pink elephants from Dumbo or the heffalumps and woozles from Winnie the Pooh. And I chose heffalumps and woozles because the pink elephant seen in Dumbo, elephants are at least real. Heffalumps and woozles are not real. They are just made up creatures that resemble weasels and elephants, but they're not really them. And this idea that this heffalump is sucking honey out of a jar and it's filling up their opaque body is just surreal and dreamlike and kind of scary. So that is the difference between those two. And you will have on your exam the term absurd and the term surreal, and you'll have to match the definitions. And so make sure that you realize the difference between these two, because a lot of people use them as, sentiment, as synonyms. They'll be like, oh, it's absurd and surreal. No, they are different. Absurd and surreal are two different styles. They are just similar. All right. And that's it. That is it for our discussion of style and theme. Um, two of my favorite elements of fiction other than symbolism, I really like talking about them because you really can go any way you want to with these elements. And that's kind of the fun part about it. So, uh, getting back to our class, that's pretty much it for this week. Um, just make sure that for week four, you have both your discussion forum and the reading response number two done, and that you are working on paper number one. And next week, we will talk about our three assignments for that and more about revising paper one. So if you have questions, let me know. Otherwise, have a great week. I look forward to talking to you again and just uh, stay safe.